As a result, faith in the UN began to diminish. A 1959 Gallup poll reported that 87% of the American people thought the UN was doing a good job. But by 1980, Gallup reported that only 31% felt the UN was doing a good job. Resistance to the globalist agenda was also felt on Capitol Hill. Between 1975 and 1982, Congress received petitions with over 11 million signatures calling for the United States to withdraw from the United Nations. But the battle had just begun. The top planners behind the globalist drive did not underestimate the resistance they would face. They were committed to build their new world order in whatever way they could, in whatever time it might take. That was the subject of The Hard Road to World Order, a frank article published by the Council on Foreign Relations. In the April 1974 issue of the CFR's journal, veteran State Department official Richard Gardner expressed his disappointment that like-minded internationalists had failed to achieve what he termed instant world government. More importantly, he described an alternate route to the creation of an all-powerful superstate. The House of World Order will have to be built from the bottom up rather than from the top down. It will look like a great booming, buzzing confusion. But an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, will accomplish much more than the old-fashioned frontal assault. Following this approach, the House of World Order Architects have adopted a variety of strategies, large and small, to achieve their goal. Yet the strength of each of their strategies rests on one key element, deception. For as British statesman Edmund Burke once said, the people never give up their liberties but under some delusion. In order to pave the way for national governments to surrender any political power to the UN, globalists need more than just a plausible pretext such as solving a crisis. They must also create the appearance of popular support for their plans. For several decades, the UN CFR Axis has been organizing non-governmental organizations, or NGOs, into a force that it calls Global Civil Society. This NGO movement has been developed by the CFR strategists as a deniable asset. For the NGOs must appear to be spontaneous and independent of the power structure. The desired illusion is that the public is demanding change. To drive their agenda forward, the CFR leadership uses the NGO movement as one arm of a giant pincer strategy. The huge NGO network applies pressure on government from below. The other arm of the pincer, consisting of CFR elites inducing political leaders, supplies pressure from above. While NGOs clamor for world governance, political leaders can respond, according to plan, to the so-called public will. And the transfer of more power to the UN is achieved when the pincer strategy is employed with a variety of pretexts. The plan to disarm civilians has been part of the earliest plans to disarm nation states. The motive is simple. If no nation has allowed the military power to challenge UN authority, then no private citizen or group should be able to resist that authority either. In the 1990s, the UN itself began to take a much more visible lead in this movement. In the UN presentation, Armed to the Teeth, the campaign for civilian disarmament is packaged as a response to a new threat. Suddenly, a global plague of small arms threatens world peace. The small arms crisis is so acute that the United Nations now considers it one of the gravest challenges facing the world. The UN demonizes the widespread availability of guns as the cause of tragedy and death and makes an extreme claim. It's not lawbreakers and terrorist movements that are the problem. It's the gun itself. The small arms are like uninvited guests who won't leave. 
Once they take over a country, they are virtually impossible to get rid of. For small arms are not fussy about the company they keep. They can murder indiscriminately. Men and women, young and old, rich and poor. This UN propaganda aims to persuade viewers that they will be better off, safer, if they allow government to take away their means to defend themselves. Of course, not mentioned in the video is the role of the UN and its revolutionary friends in fomenting much of the aggression described. The UN even goes so far as to cite the Rwandan genocide carried out with machetes as a reason to confiscate civilian guns. 800,000 men, women and children were murdered. A United Nations special rapporteur saw the disaster approaching. He warned the international community that if the arms were not collected immediately, the result would be catastrophic. In many of these instances, this horrendous slaughter could have been prevented if the civilian population had not been disarmed. Generating pressure from below, the NGO network also plays a critical role in the push for civilian disarmament. The Arm to the Teeth video contains a classic example of the pincer strategy at work. IANSA is a network of over 200 grassroots organizations from around the world, which coordinates the fight against the proliferation of small arms and also puts pressure on governments to act. IANSA was not created as the result of a spontaneous outpouring from global civil society as the United Nations would insist. It is entirely a creation of the United Nations in collaboration with tax-exempt foundations and certain socialist governments in Europe. Revolutionary strategists have long recognized that a crisis can facilitate a major change in political arrangements. Among the useful crises, war, or the threat of war, has always topped their list. The threat of environmental catastrophe is still another crisis being used to persuade Americans to accept a revolution in world political arrangements. Although many Americans have serious concerns about the environment, such genuine concern does not motivate the UN CFR elites. Their object is power. They have no interest in actually solving environmental problems as that would defeat their objective by removing the impetus for political change. More and more, Americans are being told that global problems require global solutions. Global solutions meaning UN power. History shows that giving more power to government is exactly the opposite of what those concerned about the environment should champion. The most spectacular examples of environmental destruction are those that took place under state control in the former Soviet Union and in its colonies. And it seems to me that people who are genuinely concerned about environmental protection should understand that the last thing we would want to do if we want to protect the environment is to turn over total power to a political elite that can despoil the environment without sanction. By contrast, the best protectors of the environment are private property owners, simply because they have a vested interest. Thousands of years ago, Aristotle pointed out that that which is owned by everyone is equally neglected by all alike. And of course, that principle applies to the question of environmental protection. Obviously, the people who have the greatest interest in preserving the environment are property owners, people who want to develop property to increase its value and transmit it to their own children. Convened under the pretext of saving planet Earth from environmental destruction, the 1992 UN Earth Summit was a major watershed event for the globalist agenda. The summit put governments on notice that major changes were needed in economic agendas and in our institutions of governance. The Earth Summit gathering was designed to give the illusion of planetary democracy at work. Delegates labored over details of language, while the NGOs lobbied outside for tougher measures. In fact, the principal programs to come out of Rio had already been worked out well in advance by the CFR brain trusts. In supporting the illusion of democracy at work, however, UN propaganda portrays the NGOs at Rio as an independent voice representing a cross-section of civil society. The Viking ship Gaia sails here from Scandinavia. 
bringing 10,000 messages from children of many nations. Here in the Global Forum, non-governmental organizations and environmental action groups hold their own Earth Summit under the symbolic tree of life to monitor the work of the official conference. The massive and growing NGO contingent at the United Nations has become a global rent-a-mob. And if you look at who is actually funding them, this becomes apparent. They are there to make the one-worlders who are grasping for power look more conservative by taking a more radical uh, stance in many, of, in many instances, and at the same time give the appearance that they are representing the people of the world, the voice of global civil society. Another group found at many UN conferences are the so-called representatives of indigenous peoples. The UN gives the impression that these activists represent the genuine independent voice of their people. At virtually all of the UN summits, for instance, you will see so-called representatives of indigenous peoples. You always see these same representatives miraculously showing up at these summits. They were going to come there to represent the people of their jungle or of their rainforest or of their mountain tribe. In virtually every case, they are there repeating the phrases that have been fashioned for them by these same NGO leaders who are promoting the UN line. One of the major CFR-inspired programs to come out of Rio was Agenda 21, a massive environmentalist manifesto, a UN-approved summary notes. Effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of all human society, unlike anything the world has ever experienced. A major shift in the priorities of both governments and individuals. There are specific actions which are intended to be undertaken by every person on Earth. For several decades, globalists developed the idea of a permanent international criminal court with the power to try individuals. At the dawn of the 21st century, the United Nations announced specific plans to implement such a court. Proponents suggested that the demand for an ICC simply welled up in the UN General Assembly. But the Council on Foreign Relations was clearly pulling the strings. The Council on Foreign Relations hand was very evident in the preparatory meetings for the ICC. I was at the Los Angeles uh, conference and Ambassador David Sheffer, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, was the keynote speaker. The chairman of the event there was also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, as were many of the other prominent people in attendance. In addition, we see that the legal scholars like Richard Falk and others who are putting together the actual documents themselves, uh, hammering out the wording, uh, are also members of the Council on Foreign Relations. In 1998, the UN convened a conference in Rome to hammer out a treaty that would establish the court. Much like the Nuremberg trials dealt with Nazi officials after World War II, proponents say the ICC will provide an impartial international venue to try tyrants and other assorted threats to world peace. In Rome, a widely read NGO publication reminded conference attendees where world justice was needed most. The primary target of condemnation by both the NGOs and the delegates was the United States. The ICC summit turned into a huge Bash America fest. Each day, the official delegates who came to the rostrum, as well as the NGO representatives, denounced the United States, decried us for our supposed violations of human rights, of economic rights, of social injustice. Many of them explicitly stated that they wanted to use the ICC eventually to try U.S. citizens and U.S. officials for these perceived crimes. The final day of the conference would serve as an omen. When the minimal objections of the U.S. were defeated by the rest of the delegates, the entire assembly erupted in a display of anti-American jubilation. In that brief moment, the U.N. delegates passed judgment. America is the principal, if not the sole, source of evil in the world. All that remained was the sentencing. The resulting 166-page Rome Statute has been submitted to individual nations for ratification. 
Professor Charles Rice of Notre Dame University School of Law examined the proposal for an ICC. In our system, as a law is supposed to be uh, uh, a rule of reason, uh, which uh, in a sense controls the state, uh, and the state should operate under law. I mean, this uh, there's simply no reasonable expectation that that will be the case under this. But the ICC, Rice points out, has no limits to its jurisdiction. Claiming jurisdiction to try Americans uh, for actions committed within the United States, which fit their definition of these crimes, you know, uh, crimes against humanity, genocide, and so on. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, is simply a repeal of the Declaration of Independence. I mean, this is outrageous. The Rome Statute claims jurisdiction for the ICC to try any individual charged with genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and aggression. However, no reasonable consensus was reached at the Rome Conference concerning the definition of these crimes. Their definition will be left to the arbitrary interpretation of ICC judges. There are other ICC problems as well. Judges, prosecutors, and counsel can be drawn from authoritarian regimes that are resentful of Americans. The ICC will recognize no right to a trial by jury, and certainly no right to a speedy trial. An American citizen, whether in or out of the U.S., could be accused of violating an undefined U.N. law. He would then be tried and convicted by foreign prosecutors and judges then sent to some undisclosed prison somewhere in the world. Most important, we should sign and ratify the Treaty for a Permanent International Criminal Court. The majority of ICC supporters in government cannot risk showing their hands so openly. Initially, the Clinton administration objected to some of the provisions of the ICC statute and refused to sign. Political leaders expressed similar reservations. While some of this resistance was genuine, much of it followed a familiar pattern. Many politicians will often conceal their support for radical proposals by putting on an initial show of opposition. Eventually, these false opponents reverse themselves at a strategic moment, claiming a compromise has been achieved, and the public is led to believe that its interests have been protected. Eventually, the Rome Treaty was signed by Clinton, shortly before he left office. Ratification by the U.S. Senate is all that is needed for Americans to become victims of an ICC. If a UN-controlled world government is achieved, Americans can expect their lives to change dramatically. For example, population controls would go into effect in America. These controls include mandatory abortion, modeled after China's UN-funded one-child policy. To eliminate surplus population, euthanasia and assisted suicide would be promoted. Private and home schooling would be outlawed as the UN takes control over all facets of education. New global taxes would also be imposed on Americans in addition to federal and state taxes. To transform much of the United States into wild lands habitat, millions of Americans would be relocated and miles of roads would be declared off limits. The very right to own property would be restricted and eventually abolished altogether. All law enforcement officers would fall under control of a global UN police force. Local police would exist to serve and protect the state, not the citizens. And the entire American military would fall under the command of the UN as part of the world's most powerful force, UN peacekeepers. Their prime objective? To suppress any opposition to the United Nations. If plans for a UN-controlled world government continue unchallenged, Americans will soon discover that their constitutional protections will be gone, that resistance to the UN is impossible, 
and that the once mighty America is unable to defend herself against an emerging totalitarian order.